Welcome to our third uh, lecture of our public lecture series, looking at Japan as a regional security actor. Uh, this evening, we will be looking at the U.S.-Japan alliance. Now, the U.S.-Japan alliance has been for the longest time uh, the, the beacon of stability in East Asia, really the the cornerstone of the regional security architecture, guaranteeing uh, peace and security in, in the region. It has been a, very much a win-win relationship with Japan benefiting from the US security umbrella and being capable of uh, focusing freely on its own economic uh, development after the Second World War. And for Japan and for the US, it was guaranteeing uh, a, a permanent strategic presence uh, in the region. Now, what has it become now almost uh, 70 years after its, uh, its conception? How did it evolve? What, are the, what is the nature of this, uh, this changing relationship between the US and Japan? Uh, and is it capable to face uh, some of the new security challenges uh, that we see emerging on the regional uh, security scene, such as the rise of China or the whole redefining uh, security landscape of the Indo-Pacific? Now, these are all crucial questions, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome a expert that we couldn't probably pick a better, uh, better one, Dr. Jeffrey Horning, a political scientist at the Rand Corporation from Washington. Uh, Jeffrey has been following the uh, Japanese foreign and security policy for his entire professional career, has published extensively on the issue. I will not go to his previous posting, but I'm absolutely delighted to welcome him here. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, our second speaker, and I call this an annex, uh, it's become a, a, a custom now with our public lecture. Uh, will be Dr. Ramon Pacheco Pardo, our very own VUB Korea chair. Uh, Ramon is also a lecturer at the King's College London and is a Korea expert, expert on the Korean Peninsula. We thought of bringing these two topics together because, as of course, um, the US alliance system in the region has the Japanese, but also a Korean chapter. And we thought it was a very interesting um, added to the topic to kind of bring those issues together and see also the trilateral dynamic um, in the region. Now, before I pass the floor uh, to, to Jeffrey, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, this lecture is uh, as a public one. It's being recorded. It will be made uh, available in its entirety on our YouTube channel uh, after, the, um, after it's over. You are all muted and cannot see or be seen by other participants, but you are more than welcome to uh, post your questions in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom right of your uh, screen. So without further ado, uh, Jeffrey, uh, the floor is yours for about 45 minutes, and I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. Well, let me uh, bring up my slides here. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's really uh, a pleasure to uh, be talking about this um, topic and and to be able um, to virtually meet everybody, at least have a conversation here in normal times. It would be a, an, an honor and a pleasure to be over there in Europe again and, and talking about these things. But for the time being, I'd be happy to entertain questions after the talk today. But um, the it's really a great week to talk about uh, these things, because if you've been following the news, really this last week, uh, the US-Japan alliance has been in the spotlight, um, whether it be the Quad meeting last week, and we can talk a little bit about the origin of the Quad, but also the 2 plus 2 meeting, the statements that have come out, um, which I'll get to later in my talk today, but it really is just a great, great time to talk about the US-Japan alliance. So I'll be talking about it, looking at um, um, some of the things unilaterally, bilaterally, some strengths, um, some challenges, uh, but really open to a whole host of issues here. And anything I don't cover, um, um, I'm, we can talk about later in the Q&A. But let me start by um, sort of framing the, the environment um, that the alliance uh, exists in there in the region. Um, and, and talk about uh, really a few of these regional challenges as sort of set the baseline for what we're uh, looking at. Um, 
the big one, obviously, is China. Um, there's a, a number of, of issues here, um, not just in terms of the defense spending that we see really with China over the last decade, two decades. Um, but from a Japanese perspective, it has to do with the lack of transparency with what that spending is going into. Um, you see a modernization of Chinese military, whether it be, for instance, like the aircraft carrier, whether it be advanced fighters. Um, but it's not just uh, the challenge is not necessarily just the modernization, but the fact that Chinese capabilities are becoming increasingly more uh, provocative in the region, whether it be in the Taiwan Strait, East China Sea, South China Sea. But also, if you, um, from a Japanese or from an alliance standpoint, um, you see this, inc this trend over the last 10 years of not just a more air and sea power transiting through Japanese seaway, waterways, and, and uh, airspace, but also around the Japanese archipelago. And so from the Japanese and from the alliance standpoint, China is really becoming much more provocative, much more uh, aggressive. Um, and you really see this um, sort of the snapshot of this has to do with the Coast Guard. I have the Coast Guard ship there. But what you it really is framed here in terms of the Senkaku Islands, a couple maps here. Um, Senkaku Islands, for those of you who don't know, if you look at that left map, um, it's close to Taiwan. It's, it's far out in the East China Sea. Uh, they're uninhabited. You see there are three of the largest ones, um, the cluster down there, that's uh, Uotsuri in the background, and then you have the Kojima, Minami Kojima there in the foreground. But you can see how spread out they are and, and sort of their distance there. But this is really the, the crucible of where you see uh, Japan and the China facing off a lot. In, and I, I tried to get a good graphic that the Japanese government has on their website of how many um, ships that are going into their contiguous zone and their territorial waters, but I couldn't get it right to make it look nice, so I didn't put it on. But the, the basic thought here is that the trend of Chinese incursions into Japanese waters is increasing, and, uh, and it's becoming much more of a constant. And so from the it's, it's a challenge for Japan, but um, as I'll talk about later as well, it also pertains to the alliance because the U.S. has said that any aggression against these islands fall under the security treaty. A second challenge, of course, is the perennial North Korea challenge. Um, as we see even from recent news reports that North Korea is, is making sure we don't forget about it. Um, you see there are some ranges of missiles um, on the left on the map there. Um, North Korea has capabilities that um, pose uh, problems, not just for um, US South Korean ally, but also for Japan as well, and also for mainland uh, America. And so this is uh, an issue that many US administrations have grappled with. It's also been an issue that poses a challenge for the alliance in terms of how the alliance can actually uh, deal with this if there is a role for Japan to de in, in this sort of environment. But it is a problem that nonetheless has not gone away and the challenge remains. And then a third challenge uh, is Russia. We don't tend to think about Russia so much uh, in the, that part of the world. We tend to think of it more from a European standpoint. Um, but Russia still does um, make its presence known, whether it be through these exercises that occur every so often of these large, large exercises of trying to move a lot of troops from the Western theater over to the Pacific side in preparation for an amphibious invasion. Uh, from the Alliance standpoint, there's really only two countries that this could be targeted against, which is the US and Japan. Um, but aside from this exercise, um, Russia makes its presence known still with submarines in the region, as well as like China's uh, aerial uh, gray zone incursions around Japan, Russia does the same to uh, Japan up in the north as well. And then um, if there, the sort of this hodgepodge of other challenges that still, um, you know, the, the alliance is facing, and we can basket it under this general category of stable use of the global commons. Um, you hear a lot about freedom of navigation. You hear a lot about you know, openness and trade. Um, having the ability of, of freedom of navigation is crucial. Um, you know, there's always 
challenges to that uh, when we look at what China's activity is like in the South China Sea. But it goes beyond oceans as well. It goes into the outer space and cyberspace, these new domains um, where the Japan as well as the US-Japan alliance together are working to ensure that these um, remain free and open and uh, we do not have any um, countries are not closed off from these. So with that as a um, as sort of a scene setter or, or a, you know, a situational awareness here, a baseline, let me pivot. Uh, first talk about Japan unilaterally and then move more into the US-Japan alliance. And a lot of this up front will focus more on the military component because the alliance at its heart is a war fighting relationship. Um, there is a diplomatic element and I'll talk about that, but I, I tend to focus on some of the, the military component of this relationship. So one thing I always like to remind people, and um, if you're not that familiar with Japan, this may come as a surprise. Japan does not have a military, at least in nomenclature. Japan has what they call self-defense forces or, or jietai. Um, and this goes back to um, their constitution um, that uh, came about after World War II. Um, but it does, we do not use the nomenclature military. We don't use army, air force, navy. Instead, we talk about the ground self-defense forces or GSDF, the air self-defense forces or ASDF, and the maritime self-defense forces or MSDF. And um, you see here the breakdown. It's primarily land-based. That's where a lot of the, the it's really heavy on, on the ground self-defense forces with the air and maritime components relatively uh, equal there. So even though it's not a military in name, it looks like one. Uh, here's uh, just a snapshot of some of their capabilities. Um, and I put this up there just to remind folks that it does have advanced weapons. And it's over the past decade, two decades, it's really been making some key enhancements in these capabilities. And so you see it does have advanced fighter aircraft. It has surface and subsurface ships. If you look to the right there, that is not an aircraft carrier. That is called a helicopter destroyer, but it sure looks like an aircraft carrier. And uh, if I recall, I believe it's even larger than the Italian aircraft uh, carrier. Um, it does have uh, sophisticated and advanced air and missile defense systems. Um, you also have capabilities in the air that uh, collect intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance or perform those missions. Um, you have surface and aerial capabilities to perform anti-submarine warfare. And then you have specialized forces such as what they've been developing in the ground self-defense forces to conduct amphibious uh, type uh, operations like you see there to the right, that amphibious assault vehicle. In addition to Japan having and enhancing their capabilities, Japan does have self-defense force bases all over the island. Um, and in the past decade, the key that's been happening here is this transformation of moving a, sort of their posture away from heavily focused on the north. If you look at the left map there, the northern island of Hokkaido there used to be a focus on the north because they were anticipating a, um, a northern invasion from the Soviet Union. But over the past decade, you've seen this transformation to the south, southwest. Um, that middle map there is really a breakout of the bottom part, that maritime part of the islands between, if you look on the top left, you see Kagoshima. Between that and Taiwan, that's a breakout of, of the islands there. And, and this is largely in response to the China challenge that I referred to earlier. And so you have the ground, you have the self-defense forces establishing more of a presence in the Southwest Island chain. It's called the Nansei Shoto. Um, not only just a presence, but they're actually putting anti-ship cruise missiles there as well as uh, surface to air missiles. And so you have more of this um, sort of a reposturing, understanding that the threats today are different. So now I'd like to pivot to 
the alliance. Um, I give you that just a couple slides on Japan, just so you are up to speed on what uh, the Japanese self-defense forces look like and what their posture looks like. But let me really shift now to focusing on the alliance itself and sort of the strengths of the alliance. And by far the biggest strength here is um, forward presence. Um, the forward presence, you have US presence in Japan. Um, yes, it's for defense of Japan, but it's also a public good because it helps uh, promote regional stability by having the presence there. And important to note, US presence consists of all US services and a subordinate unified command of USFJ, United States Forces Japan. And so you see here on to the left side, um, there's approximately 54,000 military personnel that fluctuates, but then you have a whole host of other civilian employees, dependents that are there as well. Um, and some of the major units that are there, um, each of the branches have a major unit, although the Army, US Army Japan is the smallest of all the services there. Um, and, uh, but still you do have a presence by all um, of the services. One thing that you hear a lot of, and again, this is sort of the, uh, the, the reciprocal relationship. So Japan not only hosts the US, um, but Japan also helps cover uh, a lot of the costs associated with the US presence. Now in 2004, there was a, uh, a Department of Defense uh, had a publication that calculated that Japan covered 74.5% of total US costs. Um, it's been unclear exactly how that's fluctuated over the year because the DOD has not released any similar uh, calculations since then. Just yesterday, the uh, Government Accountability Office released a, a study. I, I, if for those of you interested in this, it was a study on both Japan and South Korea that, um, that, that went through and detailed the costs of US presence in these countries, as well as how much the, the host country provides back. And so you see here for three years, the DOD obligated $20.9 billion for Japan and Japan provided $12.6 billion in cash payments and in-kind financial support. You do the calculation that comes out to 60%. However, this is not a one-on-one -on -one comparison with the 2004 results because they're, the calculation is different. They don't consider the same things. And so um, even though you might want to, a knee-jerk reaction, my knee-jerk reaction at first was to do it, but upon uh, discussion with the authors a little bit more, it's not a one-on-one -on -one comparison. And so they do not provide that percentage, but it is still believed to be over 70%. Uh, before Prime Minister Abe stepped down in the Japanese parliament, he actually gave a figure of, I think, uh, 73%. So it's still up there. But the point being is that Japan provides a considerable amount for U.S. presence. So obviously, U.S. bases are all throughout Japan. Um, and the, the map on the left there is just a snapshot of where some of the major bases are, like the Yokosuka Naval Base, Sasebo Naval Base. Um, but the big one, the big sort of focus has always been on Okinawa, which is the map on the right. And you see there the concentration of US bases on this very small island. Um, and over 70% of um, US bases are concentrated there on Okinawa. If you've ever been there, um, you, you see it from just driving around the island. But the one that gets the most tension is always the Futema Air Station. It's the Marine Corps Air Station Fatema. It's at the upper left hand picture there. Now, when the base was um, first established, this was on top of the hill. If you've ever been there, it's, it is on top of a hill. It's actually quite high. Um, but uh, over the years, the town grew around it. And so now right along the fence line, you'll see um, elementary schools, nursing homes right at the fence line. And so since the mid 90s, there's been a push to relocate um, to get forces, uh, you know, to shut down uh, Futenma and move the forces to someplace else, either off Okinawa or someplace else in Japan. Um, the, the decision that was made and, and the two plus two just a few days ago reaffirmed it um, is to move it um, north of in within Okinawa, Henoko Bay. And you see here the picture that's the they're building some of the runways and seawalls. 
Um, there and this is the plan to move shut down Fatema, move a lot of the operations there, but also move some Marines to Guam and elsewhere. Um, one, this has always been a, a thorn in the alliance. Um, it's gone in fits and starts, um, and even now, there's you know there's been a lot of uh, talk about the the some of the pillars that were driven into the seabed for um, this for this site are already sinking in the soft sand. And so um, it's been almost 25, 25, over 25 years since the original plans for this, for re relocating Fatema have started and we're still nowhere close to shutting it down. But this is always an issue with the Alliance. But let me go back to some of the strengths. And I really wanna focus here on highlighting a number of issues that don't always get their fair um, share of attention. Um, but really are key parts of the alliance. And they all revolve around interoperability. Um, the first is similar equipment. Um, Japan acquires more than 90% of its defense imports from the United States. And it includes some of the things you see here, like the, the F-35, the e E-2D, um, aerial early warning aircraft, um, the, the V, um, the, the V-22 there at, at the bottom, um, as well as the SM-3 Block 2A missile interceptors. Now, this, this is obviously hardware, but hardware, having commonality of hardware has benefits because it minimizes the technical aspects of, um, of interoperability challenges. And it also pays dividends in emergency. Because by having your, your ally having sharing the same spare parts means that if you run out of parts in an emergency, and your ally would likely have some of these. And by having an acquisition and cross servicing agreement means that the allies can share these to each other, share these with each other. The second is um, their regular training and exercises. They've had decades of bilateral um, training and exercises command post exercises, field training, tabletops. If the last slide was about, about the hardware, then this really is about the software in terms of the human software, because these are opportunities to maintain individual levels of operational readiness um, to enhance specific skill sets of, of each of the, the personnel, but also bilaterally, it improves coordination it enhances response capabilities. It enhances the, the skills of, uh, of the services that are involved. They develop similar methods. And also these are opportunities to share strategies and tactics with one another. And so you look at these all collectively. Um, together, it enables them to better operate together across a spectrum of, of um, conditions. A third strength um, in terms of interoperability has to do with similar operational concepts and doctrines. Much of this is due to the role that the US played in establishing the self-defense forces um, after World War II and then followed by the decades of exercises and training that we just talked about. But by having similar operational concepts and doctrines, things like having, a, you know, what I'm talking here is about submarine warfare, mine warfare, amphibian, uh, amphibious warfare. This ensures coherence between the armed forces because they embrace common language, common terminology, and that provides them an opportunity then to share assessments on operational issues when they're looking at it the same way. And it ensures then that they operate more effectively uh, in the battlefield. And then finally, and this is one that rarely receives attention, it's the maintenance support. Um, Japanese companies provide maintenance support to key um, pieces of US equipment. And so you see here, for instance, the MV-22 at the top, that's the uh, Marine uh, Osprey, the US F-18s, um, MH-60 helicopter, and then as well as um, Aegis ship, F-35 parts there at the bottom. What, what this maintenance, by having Japanese companies help with maintenance, the reason why this is a strength in the, is that it avoids these long transportation delays 
that would be associated with work on the US mainland if the US had to actually transport these things back to the continental United States for repairs or just regular maintenance. But also because they do this work in Japan, um, you know, you have interchangeable components and streamlined bilateral inventory because Japan again uses some of these same pieces uh, or the same, same capabilities. Um, there is a diplomatic, uh, and I don't want to downplay this, but this is also important as well, one of the, the, the final strengths here that I'll highlight. They share basic values and strategic interests. Um, you know, between the, the peoples of both countries, there are strong cultural bonds. Um, you know, things like right now with Washington DC with the cherry blossom season coming up, there's a very, uh, there's, a, there's a high level of attention given to the history of Japan providing those to us over 100 years ago. And so there's a lot of cultural bonds between the people, um, as well as at the political level, the basic values and strategic interests. Obviously, both democracies and market economies but all this together, and I'll use language from today, from today's world, is that all this leads them to be supporters of international law, supporting peaceful resolution of disputes, as well as wanting freedom from coercion. And so all these things together um, help um, form a very strong uh, alliance. That said, um, this isn't a sort of a negative, but it, or a, a converse statement, but it's. Um, there have been some changes, some important changes that I think have pushed the alliance um, a little bit uh, uh, forward here. Um, and the first one I'll highlight is the 2015 defense guidelines. This was the second time that the guidelines were revised. What these guidelines do in a nutshell is provide what the expected roles and missions for security and defense cooperation would be in a number of situations. Um, the 2015 version, the thing that was really important about this, and there was a lot of different things, but to just sort of say it in a nutshell, is that it identified four distinct scenarios, but it was meant to provide uh, cooperation all the way from peacetime to contingency so that you could have seamless cooperation across. Um, but the important thing that was included in this was that they could act, Japan could act, even in response to an armed attack against a country other than Japan. So this opened up the aperture for Japan to be able to respond to not just the defense of its own territory, but also uh, in other situations. And this was really brought about because of uh, changes that Japan had in its own domestic uh, situation. Um, in 2015, they passed legislation that was very controversial to some in Japan. Um, it was this suite of 11 uh, separate bills um, that together were called the security legislation that provided Japan a, a small expansion of what it was able to do or where it was able to do it. And important in, to, in this discussion was the ability of Japan to exercise collective self-defense. Um, this is just a chart showing you in 2014, a year prior to the bills, um, what kind of scenarios Japan was thinking about. At the bottom part of this, in the dark blue, these were some of the areas that were considered collective self-defense. Um, to those of you who are familiar with NATO, some of this argument may seem sort of strange. But prior to this legislation, um, if a Japanese ship was next to an American ship, and the American ship came under fire and was sinking, the Japanese ship, even though it was an ally, it is an ally, Japan could not fire back. Um, this changed it. The laws changed that to allow Japan to be able to actually come to the aid of the United States in a situation such as that. A second important change has to do more in the diplomatic realm. Um, and this is stuff that you see really in the last week, this has come back front and center. Um, but you see this free and open Indo-Pacific strategy as well as the Quad. Um, the free and Indo, the United States and Japan have a strategic alignment, but that's not to say that they always had a strategy. 
um, for dealing with the region. In many ways, the US was doing the rebalance in real recent years, and Japan was, prior to FOIP, it was engaging in different bilateral relationships. But when you have the convergence of both countries agreeing to a common strategy, suddenly you have this diplomatic engagement strategy that they didn't have before. Um, you couple that with this strengthening of four key democratic maritime nations with India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. And now suddenly the, the alliance is more regional in scope. It's not just defense of Japan. Arguably it, it has expanded over time, but really now it is much more of a regional um, vehicle by which, to, uh, by which to engage the region. And again, like before, this was made possible because of changes in Japan. Um, in 2016, Prime Minister Abe, there you see in the picture, uh, he gave a, a speech at the, in Kenya at the TCAD conference. And three main pillars he laid out, you see there in the bullet points. It was about promoting and establishing rule of law, economic connectivity, as well as peace and stability. But this strategy, that Japan promoted uh, really took off and that the Japan pitched this to the United States in 2017. And then that became part of the United States strategy, which then you see other countries in the region, including quad countries, take elements of this. And they, they might not all say FOIP, but there's elements of the FOIP concept or FOIP strategy. Um, and now it's really become a shaping uh, a diplomatic shaping element in a way that doesn't talk about China, but it still is a strategy by which countries can push back on China or alternatives to China. Um, the same, you know, the Quad here also has its history. I mean, the origination, uh, the origin of the Quad goes back to the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, when these four countries got together and helped with the HADR response. But um, in 2012, um, Prime Minister Abe wrote a essay uh, about a security diamond in which he tried to revive the concept. But it wasn't really until about 2017 that this picked up again when Australia and India and the United States, they all sort of started having the same uh, trepidation about China that it really took off again. And now we see just last week, the first leaders meeting. Um, but it's also, FOIP and Quad, um, the success is really also built off of some of Japan's new approach in strengthening its bilateral relations with a lot of other countries. So sort of just a sim simplistic pyramid that I, I drew up here, but um, sort of meant to symbolize priority of efforts. But Japan has been putting a lot of efforts in strengthening um, strategic ties with Australia and India. Um, after that, you have uh, this next set of countries that includes some key European countries and NATO, um, and then others in the bottom, we could put many more countries in there as well. But the point being here is that Japan has been being much more proactive, which has helped with um, the success of FOIP as well as other engagement um, outreaches. And then finally, um, one um, big important change here I would say is just what happened earlier this week, um, this two plus two meeting that occurred in Tokyo. The reason why I think it was important um, was one, because it called out China much more explicitly than we've seen done before. Um, you see here, uh, China referred to in terms of, um, you know, saying that it presents economic, military, technological challenges to the alliance and to the international community. Um, it talks about the new China Coast Guard law as a disruptive development. Um, something, the third bullet point is really to me one of the big, biggest highlights here is it's, it explicitly says that the Taiwan Strait peace and stability is important. Um, uh, it objects to China's unlawful maritime claims in the South China Sea. And the fifth point is also extremely important. It talks about human right concerns in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Now, these are all very important because while the alliance has talked about China and acted to sort of deter China, 
going this full going through this full list especially mentioning things like taiwan especially like mentioning these uh, human rights issues this is something we haven't seen publicly before but it really is being explicit in saying that this isn't just the us concern this isn't just a japanese concern this is an alliance concern which um, really pushes the alliance, I think, a little bit more forward in a way that it has done. Um, but on the alliance itself, there was a couple things that I think get not as not as a visible light because of what was said about China. But you you see this need for attention on things like roles, missions, and capabilities, meaning that maybe we need to think a little bit more about how we're postured against the threats. You see this word realistic bilateral multilateral exercises and training. Um, I mentioned before about the decades of exercises and training. One of the complaints has always been that these are not realistic, um, that we need to really think more and actually have more realistic uh, scenarios to train against. Um, there's talk about new domains, cyber and space, which the allies have mentioned before, but again, it's front and center. Um, and then there's a Japanese promise to enhance its capabilities even more. So I think that what we see with this two plus two is really it's it's laying a fl putting a flag in the ground in terms of this is what's important to the alliance and this is what is important to us regarding China and and, and really lays out a path forward here. Um, questions that I have and I'm trying to time this. I think my timing is is perfect here. Um, questions. Um, about the alliance moving forward. Um, one of the big things from an American perspective is the status of Japan-South Korea relations. Um, the Obviously, South Korea is a US ally as much as Japan is a US ally. And both of them are important. But the relations between our two allies have deteriorated recently that in a way that is concerning. So the question ahead is, what will happen with this you know, bilateral relationship. It's something that we do need to resolve, something that we need some, um, some improvement in. It, it's not sustainable, especially when you think about the challenges in the region. A second issue is um, Taiwan. Um, now, the two plus two statement had the Taiwan Strait in there. Um, and we have seen some statements recently by Japan's defense minister and also state minister of defense regarding Taiwan. Um, but given some of the actions China has taken against Taiwan to, to sort of you know, close its diplomatic space or be provocative against Taiwan, the question is what will the US-Japan do regarding Taiwan? Will it be more public? Will there be more high level visits, more uh, efforts to try to get diplomatic lifelines to Taiwan as well as defense of Taiwan? What is the Alliance willing and planning to do about it? And then the third one um, maybe doesn't get that much uh, you know, attention, but it's democracy promotion. Um, obviously, the US has a history of promoting democracy overseas, maybe not in recent years. Japan does not. Um, but given some of the trends we see in the region, whether it's a coup in Thailand a few years ago, whether it's what we see happening today in Myanmar, um, the, the region is more stable and prosperous when we have democracies, at least less threatening. Um, it's in Japan's interest, it's in the US interest. And so um, it'll be interesting to see moving forward whether they put democracy promotion um, uh, as one of the agenda items in the free and open Indo-Pacific. So final thoughts here before I turn it over. Um, I just wanna sum up some of the things. Um, the self-defense forces is, it's not a military, but it's a very capable force that's getting stronger, developing new capabilities, posturing differently. Um, constitutional limitations, I didn't really go into it that much, but they can s continue to set the parameters of possible action. But there is a lot that Japan can do. There's a lot the alliance can do. And that leads to the second point here. The alliance is strong. It's definitely getting stronger. Not only is it home to US forces, um, as I mentioned, all the different aspects of interoperability that make the alliance strong, and then some of these recent changes that help them get closer, both operationally as well as strategically. And then finally, um, you know, Japan's 
efforts to strengthen its network of allies and partners bilaterally, making efforts with FOIP. All the countries that Japan's making an effort to who share uh, similar concerns about China, this is an asset to the United States. Um, and it's, you know, it's supporting these efforts help maintain um, the stat the regional order. And it does provide, um, you know, important support in the time of increased stress, increased stress. So um, I think I timed that pretty well here uh, within my allotted time. I will stop there and uh, turn it back over. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, this was this was excellent. This was exactly what we were hoping for. You gave us the full picture. You you set things into perspective, and you also reassured us that the uh, U.S.-Japan alliance is, is is going stronger. I would say perhaps it's evolved. It, it, it maybe redefined its terms, and Japan has definitely redefined its position within the alliance. That's what we can see uh, today, and especially since the launch of the of the FOIP, I would say. Um, but but it's definitely there and, and, and kicking and alive and we can we can see more to come. Um, I'm more than grateful that you actually respected the time. I didn't even expect that. That's a, you know a special a special thanks for that. Um, and I'm also thankful that you raised some of the key questions actually uh, that are there pending somehow and still to be uh, answered. Um, and, and all of them are a very valid one. I haven't really thought about the democracy promotion, but it's a, it's a very, very uh, valid point in the region. And perhaps that's something that we will see Japan doing more in the future. Uh, but what, your first question uh, on the uh, future of the kind of U.S. alliance-based system, if you want, uh, in, in the region being also conditioned by um, the relationship between Japan and Korea is a very yeah, valid point. And I'm more than happy, actually, to have uh, a special uh, contribution uh, on this uh, and th that's why I invited also Ramon uh, to, to talk a little bit about the, the Korean dimension and, and hoping that it will uh, shed an additional perspective into, into this relationship. Um, so I'll, I'll switch straight to Ramon, thank you once more, um, switch to, to Ramon and then we can uh, open uh, the floor for discussion. Ramon. Thank you, Eva, and thanks, Jeff, for a wonderful presentation. And, and I think you couldn't have timed it better, right, with the, with the visit, to, <laughs> visit by Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense to, to Tokyo and Seoul uh, and Alaska, actually, right, and, and, and India, they're having diverging paths. So in the five minutes, uh, 50 minutes, sorry, that, that uh, I was allocated, I will go over the uh, state, a summary of the state of the uh, U.S. ROK Alliance, uh, uh, and then I'll touch a little bit on uh, ongoing tensions between Japan and, and, and South Korea, and, and what does this mean for uh, for the for the alliance between uh, Japan and the U.S. and trilateral cooperation potentially. So actually, I want to start with um, a, a summary of the visit by Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense uh, Austin, because I think the Trump administration really appended the alliance between uh, South Korea and, and, and the US. He clearly didn't value allies, not only South Korea, but other uh, uh, allies as well. Uh, and this strained the relationship to, I would say, unprecedented uh, levels, the bilateral relationship, for example, with his demands in terms of uh, how much South Korea should be paying to cover the cost of US troops stationed in, 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 in the country. Uh, and, and of course, his uh, pressure on South Korea uh, for joining an uh, anti-China alliance that South Korea is, wasn't willing to do. And I will talk more about this. So if we focus at the visit, on the visit that has taken place uh, these last couple of days. And as I said, Secretary of State Austin actually hasn't left yet. He's staying until Friday and then he will be leaving. Uh, what we see is that it has served to reset the alliance. I wouldn't say going back to normal, so to speak, because obviously the international system has changed over the past uh, four years. Uh, but it is true that we are going to see the future trajectory, at least the immediate future of the trajectory, in a more familiar path. Uh, this will mean uh, three things, uh, in, in my view. First of all, that on the uh, bilateral relationship component, uh, relations are going to be 
uh, fairly good. There are going to be differences, and I will talk about them, but they're going to be fairly good. So the special measures agreement uh, to, to determine the, the, the cost that South Korea has to pay for hosting uh, US troops uh, was signed uh, earlier today. Uh, actually, growing a sort of friction. If you look at the uh, Korea-US military exercises, they actually uh, wrapped up uh, today as well, right, during the, during the BC, the springtime exercises that take place on an annual uh, basis. And, and it's fair to say that both sides agreed on a scale down uh, exercises, uh, both because of uh, COVID-19, but also uh, because uh, the US is undergoing the policy review, it's North Korea policy review, so, so they want to uh, antagonize uh, Pyongyang unnecessarily. But there's, there was agreement on this, right? But uh, so what, what we see is that there is a more fluid process than you saw under the Trump administration. For example, when, when Trump, after the Singapore summit uh, with North Korea, he announced that the exercises were going to be suspended uh, and, and without advising the, the allies of Korea that actually wanted them to, uh, to, to go ahead. Uh, there has been a focus on uh, opcon transfer, which is a very big issue for South Korea. So the fact that in case of war uh, between the two Koreas, uh, South Korean troops would be under the command of, of, of the US. Uh, and South Korea wants this to, to change. An agreement was signed uh, already uh, during the uh, no Mohyun administration started in the mid 2000s for transfer to happen. Uh, so South Korea would have command of the joint forces in, in case of war with uh, North Korea. This hasn't happened yet, but you see South Korea and the US sitting down to agree on a timeline uh, as to when this could this could happen. And again, this is something that, that the Trump administration was very difficult uh, to, to agree on. Uh, in terms of focus, obviously the alliance, as we all know, uh, when it started, in the 1950s, after the Korean War, it was clearly geared towards uh, containment uh, and deterrence of uh, North Korea. Uh, the core objective has and is a bit broader today, and I will refer to this on, on, on the second point that I want to, to, to raise. But let's uh, stay on North Korea. Uh, I think it is uh, widely acknowledged in South Korea that uh, the alliance has uh, been extremely helpful throughout history, but also that uh, at this point in time, uh, if there were going to be a conflict between two Koreas, obviously there would be very heavy losses in South Korea, but South Korea would end up winning any potential war that might take um, a place with North Korea. So why are troops still in um, South Korea up to, some 25, 26, uh, 7,000 troops, uh, American troops continue to be uh, in, in South Korea. Uh, why is South Korea covered by the uh, American um, nuclear umbrella? Well, I think that uh, in South Korea, uh, the alliance has moved beyond only the terms of North Korea, and it has become a cornerstone of its foreign policy in the sense that it is considered to be an enabler of South Korea's role at the international level. And this is something that is discussed uh, very often in South Korea, how both by uh, liberal governments and, and previous conservative governments, how South Korean security policy, foreign policy is enabled by the uh, alliance with uh, the United States. It's enabled in military terms, but also it is enabled in diplomatic terms. So what we see here is that the alliance, yes, have moved beyond North Korea. And uh, one of the reasons why uh, South Korea wants to maintain the alliance is because it actually helps uh, South Korea in its own foreign and uh, security uh, security policy, uh, which takes me to another point that I wanted uh, uh, to raise, also related to the meeting that took place uh, today and yesterday between uh, Seoul and, and 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 Washington between the uh, visiting delegation from 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 the U.S. and and the South Korean uh, counterparts. Uh, which is uh, China, right? Now, we have seen the presentation how Japan and the US have similar views of China and have a fairly similar policy, right? Because you see the quote being now a cornerstone of the way Japan and South Korea are dealing with, uh, with China. Uh, it is fair to say that this is not necessarily the case for, for, for South Korea. Uh, partly because of the role that China would play in any potential reconciliation process between the two Koreas. So, so 
know, South Korea wouldn't want to unnecessarily antagonize China because of the role that it would play in the reconciliation process uh, with, uh, uh, with, with Pyongyang. Uh, also partly because of uh, the TAD issues. So for those of you who don't know, in 2017, when South Korea agreed to the deployment of uh, um, the anti-missile system, by the US that there was uh, economic retaliation from uh, China. Uh, I, I wouldn't exaggerate the role that this plays on, on South Korea's decision or different views of China, uh, because this is, it is true that there has been a process of uh, ongoing economic diversification in, 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 in South Korea. And the view that South Korea is uh, reliant on the US for security and for China when it comes to economics, uh, I would say it's not very widely shared among the elites in the country. They say, well, maybe in the past might have been like this, but uh, a few years ago, but this is clearly not the case as of 2021, or even before the pandemic, the discussion was, 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 was different, right? But what we see though, is that South Korea has a similar view to many other countries, for example, in ASEAN, that they don't see the need to choose between the US and China. Now, having said that, if it came to a choice, right, let's say, for example, and imagining here, there is a conflict, military conflict between the US and China, the choice is obvious for South Korea, it would be the US, there's, there's no question about that, it doesn't matter if you talk to conservative or the South Korean military, or if you talk to someone in, 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 in MOFA, or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in, in the Ministry of Defense, or, or, or Chongwa, they're right in the Blue House, right? They'll say there is no question about it. But obviously, they don't want to have any sort of uh, conflict between, the, uh, between both sides. Uh, even the uh, trade war that we saw during the Trump administration uh, for South Korea was unwelcome news. So this is where you see a, a bit of South Korea and the US. And this is why you see uh, South Korea uh, uh, struggling on whether to join uh, the Quad or how much to cooperate uh, with the Quad to uh, deal with China, right? Um, I, I would say that in, in, in recent months, there has clearly been a move towards a greater acceptance of the Quad, and especially uh, since the Biden administration to to took office, and I try and I try to re refashion the Quad in terms of what can the partners do together as opposed to uh, containing China, right? Uh, you have seen this uh, increasing move in South Korea towards acceptance uh, of this institution and potential uh, potential membership, right? Um, so, so this is something to, uh, to consider as well, that even though there is a gap in terms of how to deal with China, you could argue that the gap is narrowing and it could be narrowed further if the US takes a less an antagonistic approach or openly antagonistic approach as they were putting it vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Beijing. So this is a second important uh, point. And, and I would add uh, to this that uh, if you look at the uh, military buildup of South Korea in recent years, including under the current Moon administration, uh, clearly it is not about North Korea anymore. I mean, if you look at the type of uh, equipment that uh, South Korea uh, is uh, either developing by itself or acquiring from the US or from other countries. Uh, it, it is not uh, only about a potential conflict with uh, uh, North Korea, it's also about how to uh, keep China in, in, in check, right? So that, that matters uh, uh, as well that uh, in spite of the public position that South Korea might have towards its neighbor and therefore the alliance with the US. Uh, in, in, in practice, the behavior of South Korea suggests that it perceive that China could be a potential uh, threat. And uh, for the last five minutes or so, I wanted to focus on the trilateral relationship between the US, uh, South Korea and Japan. Uh, I mean, it's obvious to, for anyone to see that uh, there are tensions uh, between uh, Tokyo and Seoul. Uh, it should also be said that uh, I think on both sides uh, and, and uh, for sure in the South Korean side, there have been more recent attempts to try to uh, move beyond uh, these tensions and try to find common ground for cooperation. But for the time being, there are tensions. Now, this makes managing North Korea policy more difficult from a US perspective. Uh, it would be great if South Korea and Japan had, uh, if not a common position on how to deal with North Korea, the very least that agreed on the issues that should be uh, discussed. But we saw in the Quad statement uh, from last week that two of the issues uh, discussed were the nuclearization of North Korea plus the abduction issue, the abduction of Japanese nationals, but there was no mention 
of uh, peace in the Korean Peninsula, and obviously in the statement released uh, today by the by the Blue House uh, after the meeting, uh, or, sorry before before the meeting uh, between uh, uh, President Moon and, and Secretary of State Biden and Secretary of Defense as, uh, Austin, right? The the remarks of President Moon, he referred to denuclearization, but then he referred to peace in the Korean Peninsula, not necessarily to the Black Sun issue. So this is a sign of the diverging views that there might be, and, and the, the gap cannot be narrowed because there is no trilateral cooperation uh, as of today, right? In a few months time, this might have changed uh, with the US pressing for this. And then if we focus on China, because, because as I said, China is uh, other of the reasons why the alliance has become uh, stronger over time or uh, has continued to, uh, uh, to operate. Uh, you see how I, I wouldn't say that South Korea has a different view from Japan, right? In terms of uh, the potential threat that uh, China is, uh, but it is true that the way that South Korea has tried to do with China is not necessarily the same uh, as of Japan, right? And I think with our trilateral cooperation between the US, South Korea, and Japan, then it becomes more difficult, right? Um, um, for, for A, for Japan and South Korea to come up with a common way of dealing with China, but also for the US with its ally South Korea to try to deal with uh, Beijing as well. Uh, having said that, I want to end in a positive note. Uh, we should say that, I mean, there, there is ongoing cooperation between South Korea and Japan. Uh, so you see this in the Gulf of Aden, for example, the counter-parasite mission that we have there. So for example, last year, the navies of uh, South Korea, Japan, and, and, and the EU, actually, uh, uh, UNAP4, they conducted joint exercises. This was actually interestingly announced by the European Union, not by South Korea or Japan, but they do take place. Uh, there is an ongoing dialogue about the cyber threat coming from North Korea, coming from China, coming from Russia as well. So you see this dialogue between the South Korean side and the Japanese side, because there is a common threat uh, uh, to, 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 bo to both countries, right? And obviously to the US as well. There is also talk, for example, because if you look at the approach that they have to infrastructure building in places such as uh, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, the South Korean and the Japanese approach is, is, is fairly similar, right? In terms of the standards uh, that should be used. And clearly there is a gap there between both of them and, 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 and China, right? So you see that there are areas in which there is cooperation Obviously, they don't make uh, headlines because this is the day-to-day -day, uh, work, but it's a solid foundation for potential resumption of uh, trilateralism uh, together with the US on the issues of North Korea and, and China. Uh, and I will end up uh, with one last point that builds on trilateralism, but also goes to the US uh, ROK alliance and which builds on what Jeff said before, uh, which is the, the issue of values. Um, South Korea, I think, has undergone a similar process to what you are seeing in Japan from what uh, Jeff explained, right? It used to be very reluctant to make democracy promotion part of its foreign policy, for example. But we have seen recently, including with the coup in Myanmar, uh, that increasingly South Korea is framing its foreign policy in terms of, of values. A free market that was, um, um, that is, has been important for South Korea for, for a period of time. Uh, this morning, the joint statement, the two, just the two plus two statement between South Korea and the US included references to the rule of law, uh, uh, for example. And now we see democracy, if not promotion at the very least criticism of anti-democratic practices, even in a country that is important for South Korea from an economic and political perspective, such as Myanmar, right? Because of the economic potential, uh, you see how democracy actually, uh, promotion can be part of the South Korean foreign policy. And this creates a, more foundations or strengthens the foundations of the US uh, ROK alliance, but also potentially trilateralism between South Korea, Japan, uh, and the US. And I will leave my remarks there. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Ramon. This was a, a condensed uh, lecture on, on, on US-Korea uh, alliance in, in 15 minutes. You don't uh, often see that. And clearly, Korea is in a very different position than Japan. Uh, it is much closer to China historically, uh, physically, um, and it has a very different uh, historical um, um, background of its uh, of its alliance that really continues to shape um, uh, even the, the current kind of strategic dynamic in the in the region we already have a, a, a lot of questions piling up and um, and I have my own to be honest but I, of course I will give the priority to um, to to our students um, there's one question that is more um, I presume targeted 
to uh, to Jeffrey uh, whether the U.S. actually uh, would have an interest uh, in the uh, in Japan eventually revoking its Article Nine. Um, so that they coordinate better military on the ground. I think that's a very um, valid question in, in, in the context of Japan's kind of renewed um, uh, or new security posture itself. So what, is, what would be the, the US interest in, in, in Japan eventually revisiting its, uh, its constitution? And perhaps related to that, uh, and I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, uh, what are the negative points about using the same military hardware. I presume that um, connects to, to, to Japan as well, or perhaps using more, more offensive type uh, of, of weapons, which I believe is, is quite connected. And because uh, I would like to get uh, Ramon's intake as well, let me just add an additional question. Um, you have mentioned uh, that there were uh, tensions, uh, obviously, uh, between Japan and US, but perhaps I'm not sure if all uh, our audience is, is fully aware of what sorts of uh, tensions we're talking about. So if you could just perhaps um, shed a, a little bit of light on, on, on the roots of these questions, of these tensions, but very quickly, and the practical impact that it may have actually uh, for the United States, um, because we talked about the trilateral cooperation, but what in, in reality uh, are we talking about? Are we talking military exercises? Because they are still taking place. You mentioned already that there were actually joint exercises also between Japan and Korea uh, elsewhere. So what is really the biggest impediment uh, of, of these tensions on the, on the US alliance-based system in the region? And I guess that's a question for you, but uh, of course, I'm more than happy to, to hear uh, Jeffrey's takes uh, as well. So yeah, does the US have an interest in, in uh, Japan uh, revisiting its constitution and eventually revoking Article 9, Jeffrey? Uh, I mean, the short answer is no. Because uh, from the U.S. standpoint, this is a domestic issue for Japan to decide. And really, when you look at the fact that Japan, you know, they've had Article 9 for, you know, what, 60, 70 years now. Um, and as I showed you on the slide, they have very advanced capabilities. They train with the United States. The, the biggest uh, challenge until 2015 was the fact that um, Japan wouldn't exercise its right to collective self-defense, as I mentioned in the example of two ships in the ocean next to each other. The fact that Prime Minister Abe reinterpreted the Constitution, didn't revise it, but reinterpreted the Constitution to allow Japan to do that, that addressed that problem. Um, and so from the US, U.S. standpoint, I mean, Japan is does what it needs to do or what it you know, from, from an alliance standpoint, it does what it needs to do for the defense of Japan. I think the issue you would hear from the United States is not so much Japan changing its domestic laws or constitution, but is it spending enough on its own defense? That is an issue I think that is more of a, of a pertinent uh, of issue. But in terms of the, the hardware, I mean, operationally having the same military hardware, no, it's, 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 it's all roses, right? I mean, you, you can talk, you have the same things. I think the big challenge comes in that, like I mentioned, that Japan imports 90% of its defense imports from the United States. The issue that arises with that is they do it through this foreign military sales program, FMS. That adds additional costs for the Japanese. So now, the counter argument is it's a lot cheaper for Japan to buy off the shelf from the United States as opposed to developing itself. But when you're buying the same platforms from the that the United States have developed, you know, there's certain security issues that have to be overcome that Congress has to make sure that it's okay with an ally buying certain um, pro certain things. But then the, the primary thing that you hear from the Japanese uh, is the cost. It usually um, is some percentage more expensive by buying it um, the same hardware. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Ramon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ramon, would you like to perhaps tell a little bit more about the roots of the, the tensions and the practical um, 
limitations it has. Yes, but I mean, you, you said U.S. I, I understood U.S. Japan tensions. So clearly you didn't oh, sorry, mean sorry, that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Korea Japan. Tensions. Oh, Korea Japan. Sorry, yeah, because Korea, that's what I, I I heard and said. Okay, uh, it <laughs> must be. <laughs> what things are we talking about? Right? Uh, no, fine. Uh, yes, I th I think I mean the. I mean, I mean, the root is the the, the the historical issue, right? So, so when the uh, South Korean courts, right, the, uh, uh, when the South Korean uh, courts had to hear the case about the slave labor during the Second World War, Korean slave labor, right, that that that, that was sent to uh, to Japan, and and took a decision that uh, Japanese companies would be liable for payments uh, for for the use of a, a slave labor, right? And and, and Japan, uh, these well, Japanese companies and the Japanese government said that they didn't recognize uh, this this decision, right? So it's a historical issue that remains uh, unsolved. On top of that, you have the issue of obviously uh, uh, sex labor as well being used during the uh, during the Second World War, that remains un un unresolved, right? Uh, I, I think that the tensions themselves probably won't be solved anytime soon, but this doesn't mean that there cannot be cooperation between the ROK uh, and, and, and Japan, because this leads me to your second question, which is about the practical impact. Um, the intelligence sharing pact continues to be in place, even though in 2019, South Korea gave notice that it was going to withdraw from it. Uh, it didn't in the end, it revoked the, uh, the decision to withdraw. Uh, and actually I have to say at the time, I was quite convinced that they wouldn't go ahead uh, with that after discussions with you know, South Korean uh, colleagues, right? So there is intelligence sharing taking place. Um, you have different views about how useful uh, the pact is or not. Obviously, from a political point of view, it is very useful because it shows that two allies of the US are willing to share intelligence directly without having to go through a third party. Uh, but uh, I mean, in practical terms, uh, I have very different views both in Korea and in Japan, and, and maybe both of you will know more on the Japanese side, right? Some, some, you know, some uh, uh, official saying is uh, extremely useful because we have different capabilities, obviously. Uh, some others saying, well, in practical terms, you know, because we share intelligence anyway through other channels, I mean, maybe through with, together with the US, for example, then it doesn't make much of a difference. But from a political point of view, obviously it matters. Uh, if you focus on tech, for example, right, because uh, Japan imp imposed some uh, export curves uh, of uh, um, uh, high-tech goods to to South Korea as a result of the tensions that we were talking about. But in practical terms, uh, most of the uh, applications from Japanese companies to continue to export uh, to uh, South Korea have been approved by the Japanese government. So, so again, you have the, the politics of it, right? In theory, there are sanctions, so to speak, on the Japanese side when it comes to, to certain types of export rights and certain materials to South Korea and actually vice versa as well. In practical terms, if you look at the figures, well, there hasn't been uh, much, of an, much of an impact as a result of this. And I would go uh, even further with this uh, tech alliance that the US now uh, is championing, not only the US, we have European countries, the European also talking about potentially a tech, tech alliance. Uh, clearly, both Korea and Japan are going to be uh, a part of it, and there is going to be a, a degree of cooperation in the, in this area uh, as well. So I think that the practical negative impact of ROK Japan tensions, maybe it's more on what I said before, that there is limited coordination on North Korea policy and, and even on, on, on China policy. And on China policy, even though the views are fairly similar, uh, the coordination is not there, right? Um, so, so that's an area in which, again, from a practical point of view, probably the U.S. will have to, without forcing them openly to solve the dispute, because I think the U.S. might not be willing to do this, but behind closed doors, it might be asking the two of them to cooperate, at the very least, on, on, on dealing with uh, these two issues, North Korea and China, something that they have been uh, doing yet. Uh, I, I will add one uh, last point that I would frame the tensions between uh, Japan and they're okay in terms of the tensions that you see 
uh, with many other former colonial powers and, and, and their colonies. So I don't think this is unique uh, to the japan ROK relationship. It's only that the two of them obviously are neighbors and are fairly similar in terms of being democratic, uh, market economies, et cetera, et cetera, and being close allies of, of, of the US. But I think the are line tensions. I think they are very difficult to solve. So they just have to, 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 to live with them. Uh, and sometimes they can. And over the past few years, it hasn't been possible. But then this has to mean that you know, in a few months' time, we won't see more cooperation again. If I could just make one follow-on to what Ramon just said, um, you know, when he was talking about the intelligence sharing pact that Seoul threatened to um, cut, um, what was really uh, interesting was at the time, um, in a real rare criticism, you had the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Defense Department and the uh, ambassador to uh, Seoul criticize the decision and say that this would impact the U.S. Uh, defense. This would this would impact U.S. strategic interests. This is something that's really um, unique um, in the fact that you you don't usually have the U.S. publicly criticizing its allies like this, but you had this across the board: uh, state defense saying bad decision, don't go through with this. This would harm your interests and. Um, and I don't know what, if it was that, if it was that publicly, I can imagine privately it was much stronger. Um, but for whatever reason, Seoul, as, as Ramon said, Seoul did in the end back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank to, to both of you. Actually, I thought it was important to remind that because not we, we just take it for, for granted that, of course, the, the two countries are um uh, have their uh, differences but uh, we, we perhaps don't hear that enough in in the european context and it's true that it reminds us of of the many historical tensions that we still see in northeast asia especially and it is not just about china uh, but it is also between the two completely like-minded countries with you know who could not share more actually in common in terms of strategic interests in terms of partners in terms of values in terms of everything and it's quite um, regressible that uh, you know we, we get to this point despite all those uh, all those similarities um, anyway I'll pass to the second a round of, of, of question if that's uh, if that's okay uh, some of them are quite hypothetical actually uh, I was uh, surprised uh, to see okay oh there's a new one sorry um, could uh, Japan eventually uh, be involved in a military confrontation with China? I suppose that was partly uh, also answered by um, already in, in the presentation when, when Jeffrey was talking about uh, the, the, the threat environment that Japan is, is actually faces because it, it, China is, is one of definitely is part of this threat environment um, and by uh, the same uh, person actually from the audience what if uh, Japan turns its code completely and eventually uh, decides to side with China and against the United States um, in the context of possible uh, ongoing domination of China in the Indo-Pacific so I guess that's a that's a little bit of a thought-provoking uh, question but we also have um, one by Chris Hughes, uh, and uh, I'm reading it as we speak. Question to Jeffrey. Uh, I agree that the US-Japan alliance is becoming more integrated and the stronger, but can the US deploy sufficient capabilities to really maintain the balance of power in the alliance favor as China's strength grows and especially its access denial? True. If the U.S. cannot do this, how will Japan have to make up the short uh, make up for the shortfall of its own capabilities, or could this fundamentally fracture the functioning of the alliance? Uh, that's uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thanks for for being with us uh, this evening as well. Uh, so that's two very good questions uh, to mostly uh, mostly Jeffrey. Um, and I will add perhaps a, a kind of a third one if we have time. Uh, do you see a major change uh, uh, post Suga? Uh, do, do you see, because a, a lot of these, um, you know, reiterated, uh, reinvigorated US Japan alliance has been done in the context of still of, of, of the Abe's policy, but do you really see a major change now uh, with, with the new administration in power? Obviously, well, 
yeah, thank you. And Chris, uh, I don't expect anything less from you in terms of your questions. Thanks for, for asking that. Um, let me take the first one first. Um, of course, uh, Japan could uh, be involved in a conflict with China. Um, it could be involved with a conflict with China either um, because of a Chinese attempt to uh, take the Senkaku Islands. It could be involved in an con unintended conflict because of all the ships and air, air power that China is bringing against Japan on a daily basis. You could have an accident, a clash, uh, and that could devolve very quickly um, if the both sides don't have good communication about what happens. Um, but of course, you could also have a, a third uh, possibility of if China takes tries to uh, invade Taiwan and the United States is involved in a defensive Taiwan. Um, of course, you look at the geography and where are US bases and ports. Um, you know, Japan could just become a, a target of a conflict and sucked into the target or sucked into the conflict either willingly or unwillingly just because of its geography and any involvement it might do a support of US operations, either rear area or front line. Um, there's a whole host of capability or possibilities. Bottom line is yes, it could definitely be involved in a, in a conflict with China. And that's the whole reason why um, Japan and the US have been strengthening their relationship and capabilities. Chris's question is interesting because um, yeah, I, I think there's two ways of looking at that. If we're looking at um, peacetime shaping, um, does, J does the US have the capabilities to sort of shape and deter China in peacetime? Um, there, the question is, you know, th there's nothing that new that, J that the United States can bring to the table right now. And it's obviously not deterring China, if you look at all its provocations that it's been doing in the region, I, I think the real question is in a contingency, does, does the United States have sufficient capabilities? And there's, there's a real question because in a contingency, if you look at just the tyranny of distance, I mean, the United States has m many more capabilities further from the theater. And so in a contingency, the United, the China would have an advantage um, as the first mover. Um, and then after that, it really becomes, does the United States have sufficient capabilities that it can surge to Japan and to the theater? And that's, that's where I think problems maybe start to arise in terms of just trying to get everything um, to, to the theater in time. But in terms of peacetime balance of power, um, I mean, if you're just doing bean counting ship on ship, plane on plane, um, of just US versus China, then of course, I mean, China's going to be, you know, the, the scales are gonna tip in China's favor. But when you start to uh, incorporate, you know, US allies, not just Japan, but Australia and NATO and all the other, um, you know, the capabilities that our allies have, these are for, force multipliers. And I think in that sense, then the, the question, China doesn't have that to draw on that. They, they're China and that's it. When they start, when their arsenal goes empty, they're empty. Um, but the United States has a lot of friends and partners to rely on lots of different access. And so I think in that sense, I don't know, you know, if I would say it evens out or balances or puts it in our favor, but I think there's a whole host of other things other than just bean counting. And I know that's not, I, I know Chris is not just bean counting, but um, I think there's a whole host of things there, but I don't think things are, I, I wouldn't put the white flag up and say things are in favor of China and be done with it. I, I think there's there's a lot of things that the United States has to draw on. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I guess the last question about Suga, you yeah, asked a question. Perhaps, if, if, if you don't mind, and, and you know, since we don't have that many uh, more questions, I would perhaps ask you for a last roundup also to, to Ramon, uh, in a sense of what do you see as the as the best form of kind of future engagement? I mean, we, we mentioned Quad, we mentioned, uh, you know, Japan support for, let's say, um, ASEAN or not just Japan's, but uh, quite a few regional countries kind of trying to, to maintain the ASEAN centrality while the Quad being there in, in parallel. Uh, what do you kind of see um, as, um, as the, you know, immediately looming new feature on, on the regional security architecture 
uh, landscape, if you want. I mean, is the quad here to stay? Does it have the potential to solve all the region's problems? Uh, do we need to accompany it with, uh, with maybe uh, other forms of, uh, of, of structures? Or, or, or where do you think uh, it's, it's all heading? And that's a little bit maybe too general, but just a few final thoughts on, on, on that would be great from both of you, if that's possible. Okay, well, let, I'll finish on Suga and I'll answer that as well. I, th I think that I don't see any any changes with post Suga. I mean, I, I think from the from the Japanese standpoint, they have one alternative, and that is the United States. That's it. There, there is, you know, and that gets to the other question about whether China would turn tails and go with China. I, I don't think that's realistic. I, from the Japanese standpoint, it's the U.S. ally and that's it. And so the question really comes down to post Suga, do you get a prime minister who has, is heavily interested and forward leaning as Abe was, or do you get somebody like Suga who doesn't really put a lot of attention on security issues, partly because of COVID, but um, you know, uh, the next prime minister, whoever that may be, would he be as forward leaning as Abe was? And that, that I don't know. If you have somebody like Kono, um, you know, previous defense minister, foreign minister, he may be. Uh, Ishiba is a former defense minister. He's He may be forward-leaning as well, but being forward-leaning is, is one thing. Having the political base to do that is another, and Abe had both. Um, Kono or Ishiba might not have the political capital to be as forward-leaning as, as Abe was. Um, but then the, the question you asked about the quad, I'm, I think the quad is is a great first step. It's a good signaling. I think it, it shows some commonality. But my own view is that um, what comes next? Like for, for the quad to really convince me, um, we need substance. We need an agenda. And, and I know that the joint statement and the Washington Post op-ed, they had a lot of things in there about technology, about climate change, about vaccines. I think those are good. Um, but that's not necessarily a long-term agenda here for this sort of organization. And I've heard people here in Washington already say, well, if the Quad is central, but ASEAN is central, you can't have two centrals here. So which one is it? Um, and I don't have the answer to you know squaring that circle, but I do think that there are some questions to be fleshed out yet about the quad. I'm not saying, I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm not, you know, saying pouring cold water on it. I think it's a great first step. I think it's it's really um, comforting to see these sort of four democratic maritime nations come together and, and sort of share strategic visions with one another. But in order to really go to the next level now, um, I think more of action plans or agendas, you know, more substance need, but that that's, that's going to come from now. So it, it's, it's not a, it's not a criticism. It's just going forward, more needs to be done. I, I think to to add to what was just said, I, I think probably are going to see a, a multitude of forums in a very Asian way, right? So, I mean, the quad, as we have seen, probably is going to continue to deepen cooperation. Of course, there is talk about uh, quad plus as well, right? Even if not uh, in all issue areas, but in some areas you could have the Quad plus uh, some other countries, you know, Korea, Indonesia, New Zealand, uh, Vietnam, for example, as well. Uh, so, so I think it will continue to 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 grow. Um, I think when it comes to ASEAN centrality, and 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 this is an interesting point because ASEAN centrality seems to come and go, right? And now it seems to be on the rise uh, once once again. But then at some point there will be criticism of centrality or there will be discussion of, well, ASEAN is not doing enough, right? This cannot be uh, cent 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 central enough. So I guess it will continue to feature and it will uh, strengthen and weaken uh, depending on, on, on uh, where we are. Uh, we haven't discussed it today, but of course there is uh, the potential for some trilateralism between China, Japan and, and, and Korea, not necessarily on, on security matters. But the three of them, at least on paper, remain committed to a degree of of of, of cooperation, uh, and and we have the TCO, Trilateral Cooperation Organization, right, which might not be as effective uh, as people hoped when it was launched, but continues to, uh, to 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 be there. Of course, we have talked throughout the session today the potential for trilateralism between the U.S. and its two uh, allies, uh, uh, Korea and Japan. So. 
so that could be revived and clearly the, I think like clearly the Biden administration wants it to 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 be to be revived. Uh, and then what I find interesting is that you know if you talk to officials in the region, not only in, in Japan and Korea, but if you talk to officials in other countries in the region, they, they talk about, for example, the, the role that the ADMM Plus uh, plays in bringing together the 16 countries, right, uh, that are part of it, in issues such as crisis management, for example, right. And we don't discuss this very often, but if you talk to uh, those who actually have to uh, cooperate with each other through this format, they they find it useful as well. So there are also these other formats. Uh, that may come up. One thing that I think won't happen is uh, a Northeast Asia, whatever you want to call it, peace and security mechanism, uh, cooperation uh, initiative, cooperation, peace cooperation initiative, right? It has had different names over time because it has been tried many times and it seems difficult to get uh, six parties or five parties if you don't want to include uh, North Korea uh, to come up with a framework they agree uh, they agree on, right? So, so I think that's the one that we can discount for the time being. I don't see it happening. But then I think that there will be these other mini laterals, uh, probably in parallel and dealing with uh, with, with with different issues. Uh, and and one thing that I think would be interesting to to hear from both of you at least from from Jeff is because all this talk about the Quad becoming an Asian NATO, and I think we can agree that this is not going to happen. But if on on the way to NATO, where could Quad it's stop, right? Because I mean, I think if you talk to anyone, they would say NATO is not going to happen in Asia. But if for some that's the goal, where, where do we, where do you think that, you know, uh, the Quad could finish in terms of the more security type of cooperation as opposed to vaccines, for example? Excellent. Thank you very much, Ramon. I, I think, uh, well, I would agree. Uh, I think uh, the Quad is the new kid on the block, is the, is the kid that we talk um, a lot about and it's very loud and we're all here to stay but it does not mean that it you know supplements all the other existing initiatives and of course uh, besides all the sub-regional ones that you mentioned there's also the ASEAN regional forum there's uh, all those big ones that actually somehow bring it together and and, and manage to uh, focus on, on some of the smaller issues as well and, and somehow holds it this whole um, uh, diverse uh, security environment uh, together. Well, uh, I would like to thank you both for your excellent uh, presentations, for shedding some light into uh, uh, this, this uh, fascinating world of the uh, changing Indo-Pacific that we have been looking at for the last month through these uh, lectures. Of course, it's not um, over yet. Uh, and I would like to just invite you in a kind of shameless uh, self-promotion uh, to the next of our uh, lectures, which will be next week. Uh, and here we will kind of close the circle, uh, looking at Japan and India, uh, the, the new um, bilateral relationship that has been very much uh, shaping the Indo-Pacific uh, strategic space as well. Uh, with uh, a lecturer from India and from Japan. So we will hear uh, crossed views. And of course, if you are not, if you don't have enough, there is not just lectures that the Japan program proposes, but there is also um, a, 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 another conference next week uh, where we will be discussing um, actually Japan and Korea's uh, also, uh, among others, uh, approaches to uh, the, the regional um, some of the main most burning regional security issues, which is bipolarity, which is the US-China rivalry. Uh, of course, uh, stay tuned, continue to follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can rewatch this lecture on our YouTube channel and of course, follow our activities on our website. With this, I would like to thank you once more. Wish you a lovely evening in Europe and afternoon in the US. Uh, stay well, uh, stay healthy, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.